Before the advent of digital photography, everyone captured their memories on film, and film needs to be processed. In the 1960s, small drive through stands began popping up on roadsides and parking lots across the United States to provide photo finishing service in a fast and convenient manner. Here you could drop off your film for development and pick up your glossy photos the very next day. What started as one store in 1965 bloomed to over 4,000 of these golden roofs across America by 1980. Shortly after though, it would all fall apart in spectacular fashion. Today we embark on a trip back in time to investigate what exactly happened to Photomat. A man by the name of Charles Brown of Pinellas, Florida opened the first Photomat prototype in 1965. The concept for Photomat was so simple, it's shocking nobody had commercialized the idea previously. After all, you have drive-in restaurants, banks, and movie theaters, why not drive throughs for photo finishing? With the increasing demand for photography services in middle-class suburban America, it was a decent bet this type of business could go the distance. Reuben H. Fleet was a pioneer of American aviation who created the Consolidated Aircraft Company. Serving in World War I and founding the company that supplied the Allies with heavy bombers in World War II, his son had a family legacy to live up to. Preston M. Fleet, born 1934, followed in his father's footsteps, helping to found the WD-40 company, whose product was originally formulated for use on the Atlas missile his father's company produced. In 1967, the already wealthy younger Fleet co-founded the Photomat Corporation along with a man named Clifford Graham. Acquiring the small Florida operation from Charles Brown for $41,000, it was time for these two entrepreneurs to bring Photomat nationwide. Fleet, while receiving the lion's share of the credit in contemporary retellings, was only one half of the story. Fleet had brought the idea and the initial capital to a charismatic man in San Diego, Clifford Graham, and Graham was the real mover and shaker. Sporting red hair, a pearl-handled pistol, and connections to some of the deepest pockets in San Diego, the Photomat Corporation's co-founder would eventually move and shake his way into 22 federal indictments and a nationwide manhunt, but that would be skipping ahead in the story. Graham, the first president of Photomat, took the basic idea of a drive through photo finishing store and re-engineered the concept to work on a massive scale. What Photomat would begin doing, starting around their headquarters in La Jolla, San Diego, is set up dozens of these kiosks in parking lots and on the side of roads. The reason they'd be able to set up dozens at a time is because each Photomat was a 5 by 9 foot prefabricated building that could be dropped virtually anywhere with permanent locations requiring only 3 days of setup time. Heated for winter and cooled for summer, these tiny Tiny stands would have windows on both sides so traffic could be served both ways. Each stand had one employee working at a time, collecting used rolls of film ready for development. Couriers would hit each photo mat throughout the day, transporting used rolls of film to a central photo mat lab. Here the film would be developed, turned into prints, and shipped back to the photo mat that it came from. The next day, a customer could pick up their prints at the photo hut that they previously dropped them off at, in a process that seemed like magic. Along with the sale of photo finishing services, Photomat was able to bring in additional revenue, selling customers fresh rolls of film, flash cubes, and other photographic supplies. Needless to say, the business model was extremely efficient on Photomat's end, with low startup, overhead, and labor costs, and it provided Americans a new level of convenience, finishing photos and purchasing film without ever having to leave the car. Further incentivizing the men of the household to get photos developed, Graham employed a tactic used by airlines lines of the day, prioritizing the recruitment of women to run the kiosks called Photomates. The final element of this master plan, which would fuel Photomat's expansion even further, was to franchise the business, allowing anyone to get in on this booming industry and build a Photomat of their own. Targeting shopping center owners especially, Photomat would boldly state in newspapers across the country, you'll be hearing and seeing Photomat's advertising in your area soon. They weren't wrong. One of the greatest retail expansions at the time in American history was about to begin. Fueled with money and connections, Graham used every angle he had to get these golden blue huts open. 
Since their marketing concept had no patent protection, the company figured the best way to capitalize on the drive through photo finishing store concept was to open as many of them as quickly as they could. Photomat needed to take America by storm in order to become the preemptive juggernaut in this arena. In the summer of 1967, Photomat had 10 stores. Two years later, in the summer of 1969, Photomat had 600 stores in the United States and Canada. Fleet would later brag at one point they were opening 90 stores a month, something almost unheard of. By 1971, Photomat had 1,150 stores. That same year, the Photomat Corporation went public on the New York Stock Exchange. At its height, co-founders Fleet and Graham each had stock worth over $60 million. Photomat going public now meant that there were major financial interests investing in the company, one of which sent a man of their own to take part in the management of Photomat. This executive, Richard Irwin, was quick to notice something wasn't on the up and up with one Clifford Graham, who they proceeded to oust unceremoniously in 1971 from the president's seat after two years of consecutive losses for the company. That rapid expansion had come at a price, a hefty one that would soon threaten the survival of the company. The 1970s would be the Kodak golden years for Photomat. By the end of the decade, there would be almost 4,000 golden roofs dotting the North American continent. Photomats, while not exactly as memorable as McDonald's golden arches, are still quite fondly remembered to this day. Not only did the tiny stands feature nice aesthetics, but pulling up to the golden roof also meant that you were about to receive a stack of brand new memories you had created. There was an excitement to seeing the results of what you had captured, almost akin to receiving a present, something we take for granted in the days of digital photography where that photo development process happens in a matter of milliseconds. While opening many stores and posting profits throughout most of the 1970s, these profits would begin to shrink in the latter part of the decade, eventually resulting in a loss in 1979. The 1980s would be even less kind to Photomat, the decade the chain would fade into obscurity. So what exactly happened? The first problem Photomat began running into, even in its most successful days, was the kiosk itself. The consequence of having a kiosk with room for only one employee was, first, that Photomat couldn't carry a large variety of photo equipment to sell to its customers that other brick and mortar chains could. In later years, Photomat would try to solve this with the addition of some larger brick and mortar shops, but never strayed very far away from their original kiosk model. A more serious problem with a single employee kiosk is that you can't add or subtract the number of employees working at any given time. A big problem considering photo finishing is a seasonal game. The most memories are captured and developed around the holidays. While brick and mortar photo stores could hire extra employees to handle the additional customers during peak times, each photo mat was still that, a photo mat, with one employee manning the kiosk. This meant sometimes the employee's job was very manageable in other times it was nearly impossible to keep up with the demand. A more serious issue Photomat began facing were concerns over quality. When Photomat started, 90% of the developed film was coming out of Instamatic cameras. These small cameras for amateurs rendered blurry photos owing to their plastic lenses and small film size. The name of the game was Speed. Photomat was thriving off of taking your film, getting it to one of their 10 labs across the country, developing your photos, and getting them back to you as quickly as possible, naturally at the expense of quality. What began to happen in the mid-1970s is many amateur photographers became more serious, investing in the larger, more expensive 35mm format with SL LRs featuring glass lenses rendering sharper, higher resolution photographs. Photomat was not at all prepared for this shift in the market, where customers began caring less and less about how fast someone could develop their film in an unprofessional manner, instead opting for slower development where a trained eye could carefully examine each negative and fine-tune their photos for large, high-quality final prints. While very late to the game, this is one issue Photomat was partially able to address. In 1978, they debuted Series 35, where serious amateurs could pay for their 
their 35 millimeter film to be expertly developed in a separate part of the photo lab. This new product resulted in Photomat going from developing less 35 millimeter film than the industry average to more than the industry average. Unfortunately, it was a small bandage on a far bigger wound, and that wound was inflicted by Photomat itself in the form of overexpansion. When Clifford Graham set Photomat up, it was a game of expanding into new markets as quickly as possible, with many stores to cast the widest net possible. Part of the strategy involved franchising some of the locations. Photomat grew so fast and in such great numbers, many kiosks were not so much competing with other photo finishing outlets, but rather with each other. CEO Richard Irwin told the New York Times in 1981, quote, The biggest single factor was our own ineptitude. New kiosks were put up near existing ones, cannibalizing sales. Not only did this diminish sales at each individual photo mat, but it also resulted in a string of lawsuits between the franchisees and the photo mat corporation over territories, which impacted photo mat's profits for several years and resulted in photo mat eventually buying out all of the franchisees. Compounding this problem was increasing competition from new players in the market. For a decade, Photomat was the second largest photo developer in the United States, second only to Eastman Kodak itself. There were other similar photo developing chains like Fox Photo. A kiosk of theirs is actually featured in the movie Back to the Future, but Photomat held a respectable lead over all of their major competitors throughout the 1970s. What began to happen in the late 1970s though, as the Americans' appetite for photos grew and grew, was that new players entered the market. Pharmacies and discount stores began offering photo finishing services on par with Photomat's quality, but at a substantially lower price. Chains like Target and Kmart would develop photos at a loss simply to get the customer in the door, where customers would then go on to spend money on other profitable products once inside. Photomat didn't have the luxury of making photo finishing a loss leader to get people in the store. Not only were Photomats just a kiosk, but also that photo finishing service accounted for 90% of their business, so it had to turn a profit. Not only did this increase in competition cut into Photomat's base of consumers, but it also meant in response, Photomat had to devise ways to remain competitive. One such strategy was giving customers a new free roll of film every time they stopped to drop off their previous one. This kept many customers going to Photomat, but it came at the cost of bad margins and lower profits, just trying to stay alive in an increasingly competitive market. The sheer number of stores, plus an increase in competition, meant Photomat would inevitably begin contracting at the first sign of a major shift in the market. That shift happened in the early 1980s in the form of the One Hour Photo Lab. Even in modern times, you've probably spotted advertisements for one hour photo labs on the side of pharmacies. This technology, which gained mass adoption in the 1980s, allowed retail stores to invest in a mini lab of their own, where a technician could develop a customer's photos, fine tune each for quality, and give the customer back their prints all within one hour of time. Solving for both the quality issue, which pushed customers away from Photomat, and the time issue, Photomat faced becoming obsolete. Thankfully for Photomat, these mini labs cost retail stores a pretty penny. In 1981, CEO Richard Irwin assured anyone who'd listen he wasn't too worried about these mini labs. A Merrill Lynch analyst would concur in the same 1981 New York Times article, saying, quote, It's not going to be a problem for Photomat. I don't think this one-hour processing will take off. At the time of that article, approximately 600 stores across America offered one-hour photo development. By 1988, 15,000 stores across America were offering one-hour photo development. Game over for Photomat. Prior to the collapse, Photomat attempted to use what assets they did have in order to acquire other businesses, hoping to diversify their revenue stream. These acquisitions included a school photo company, a training film company, and Video Services of America. Video Services of America offered a service that would soon take America by storm. 
movie rentals. Six years before the first blockbuster opened its doors, Photomat was renting movies out of their gold kiosks. The way you'd use this service is you'd call a toll-free number and order one of 130 movie titles. The video cassette would be sent to your nearest Photomat for pickup. Over the very short lifetime of this service, Paramount Pictures, Disney, and MCA all entered agreements to distribute movies through Photomat's photo huts. The problem with this business, as with all Photomat's businesses, was how costly the service became for the company to operate. With Photomat's main product, film development, some kiosks were in locations so far from a Photomat lab, Photomat would need to fly the film overnight to a lab in another state and back, the shipping alone costing Photomat more than what they were making from the customer. Similarly, with their video rental business, the toll-free calls alone were costing Photomat more than they were making on the rentals themselves. In 1982, with the rise in brick-and-mortar video rental stores offering same-day rentals, Photomat's video rental service was discontinued. Following the decline in sales due to increased competition and the subsequent crash in sales due to the mass adoption of the one-hour photo lab, Photomat's central product, one-day photo development, had been rendered non-competitive. Many kiosks closed, and in typical Photomat fashion, even the store closures themselves were total losses. Typically, when a retail store goes under, it is liquidated, where assets that hold value are sold off, generating cash on the way out. A dead retail store can soon become a building for someone else to use. The store sits on land, which can also be sold. These, of course, are valuable assets. In the case of Photomat, though, only 15-20% to 20 of their locations were able to be sold to anyone, as in most areas there was zero use for these tiny, prefabricated parking lot buildings. Some former photomats found second lives as coffee shops, emissions testing facilities, locations for locksmiths, and so on. The vast majority, though, simply closed, and sat rotting away in parking lots until the property owners finally demolished them. To this day, several former photomats remain standing across America. Ending the Photomat Corporation saga in 1985, shareholders had to choose between Chapter 11 bankruptcy or handing the company over to Japanese photo giant Konishi Roku, soon after known as Konica Photo. Photomat would be sold to Konica, at which point it became a private subsidiary, after which little is known. What had been a chain 3,800 locations strong at the start of the 1980s dwindled down to 800 locations by 1990. By the 2000s, with the advent of digital photography, photography, Photomat had become nothing more than a website for managing your photos. Photomat's parent company, Konica, would soon merge with another photo brand, Minolta, in 2003, with their photography assets being sold to Sony in 2006, spawning the modern era Sony Alpha Series SLRs, dominant in the prosumer digital photography market today. In 2009, Photomat's website was shut down. The end of an era. While Photomat's iconic kiosk is in many ways unique, the story of their downfall is not. When a company grows so fast it goes public almost immediately and becomes more focused on showing rapid growth to shareholders than it does fine-tuning its services to the future needs of the customer, its downfall becomes inevitable. There are only so many markets you can expand into before you start cannibalizing your own. There are only so many companies you can afford to acquire in a desperate attempt to diversify before you default on your debt. In the 60s, Photomat disrupted the market of four-day photo services offering one-day service, but failed to innovate, finding themselves obsolete come the one-hour photo technology of the 1980s. Fundamentally, Photomat is a tale of a company that lived and died in the name of progress. So that's what happened to Photomat the company, but we also have to find out what happened to Photomat's first president, Clifford Graham. <laughs> Following Graham's ousting from Photomat in 1971, he embarked on an increasingly wild ride of the criminal variety. His next venture was a chain of health food stores called Health Tree. This venture was a complete failure that quickly went bankrupt and became the subject of many legal proceedings. A recurring theme for Graham appeared to be as follows. Step 1. Persuade rich people, politicians, and the like to invest in his latest fantastical business proposal. Step 2. 
take their money, write checks out to cash to buy planes, yachts, and houses. Step three, go to his favorite bank and get them to loan him seemingly endless funds to make this latest business venture appear legitimate. Step four, when the venture inevitably goes sour, tie the investors up in endless legal proceedings so most just write it off as a bad investment, and whoever holds out gets paid with more money loaned from the bank as the loan is rolled over into another loan for his next big con. And you might be saying, hold on, even if this guy had that sort of access to a bank, how does a bank keep giving out bad loan after bad loan and survive? Well, see, it didn't. A year after Graham started the health food stores, the bank funding this insanity, United States National Bank of San Diego, defaulted in what was the largest bank default in United States history back in 1973. A former investigator told Matt Potter of the San Diego Reader back in 1996, quote, Graham had a loan limit of, I don't remember how much to tell you the truth. It could have been 100, 200, 300 or 400 or a couple of million. I don't remember a limit that he was basically pre-authorized to borrow up to that amount. Crocker National Bank, which picked up the insolvent bank's assets, went after Graham for the millions of dollars he owed. Eventually, they simply gave up and the federal government ate over $2.7 billion adjusted for inflation in bad loans from this one bank. Which means Graham's ventures, quite possibly including the earliest days of Photomat with its rapid expansion, were partly funded by the U.S. taxpayer in the end. I think it's quite evident why Photomat wanted Graham out after they went public and financial scrutiny increased. Once the fallback of the bank was no more, Graham was in a precarious situation where he couldn't bail himself out any longer when investors realized that they had been defrauded. In his final most epic gambit, Graham founded a metals firm in 1979 called AU Magnetics. Here, he sold wealthy investors on the idea of a new precious metals extraction technology. His company would use the investors' funds to create a process by which gold and other metals could be extracted from mining waste using magnets. Showing photos of the prototype device, this real-life Bond villain had investors convinced he could actually make gold out of sand. Turns out, of the nearly $13 million Graham raised in his final scheme, defrauding major politicians and members of the Dow chemical family in the process, only $3 million of those dollars went towards the actual product. The way this fraud was discovered is that investors threw a coup at Graham's headquarters in La Jolla, San Diego. With armed private investigators in tow, they forced Graham to relinquish his signature firearm. The investors proceeded into his office and examined boxes of his personal files to discover the entire thing was a sham, with millions of dollars worth of check stubs being made out to cash. So where did the money really go? Graham had a 180-foot yacht, a fleet of planes his friends called the Air Force, and a Rancho Santa Fe estate once owned by Bing Crosby. Facing civil suits from investors in the metals company and soon to be federally indicted on 22 counts including mail fraud, wire fraud, tax evasion, and filing false tax returns punishable by up to 104 years in federal prison and a $100,000 fine, Graham packed his car, locked the gates to his Rancho Santa Fe estate, and drove away in May of 1985. After the news of his final gambit hit the newspapers, there was a nationwide search conducted by the FBI for Clifford Graham, including the distribution of 40,000 wanted circulars to investment firms, marinas, and boat dealers across the country. It seems the FBI was well aware of how much Clifford Graham loved his yacht. Despite their best efforts, Photomat's co-founder was never seen or heard from again. At its core, Photomat is a true product of the 20th century. Beautiful, nostalgic, and behind the scenes, a little shady. You'd be surprised how many of these larger-than-life characters from the 20th century willing to do extra-legal things in pursuit of their own self-interest inadvertently contributed to society in the form of products and services we look upon fondly to this day. One last thing a lot of you might be wondering, where did Photomat employees go to the restroom? 
Well, former employees say they had deals worked out with the closest stores where employees could run in when nature called. Other than that, thanks to the windows on three sides and the heating and cooling available in these prefabricated golden huts, former employees say that Photomats was not a bad place to work, despite what may seem to be a claustrophobic space. And that Fox photo kiosk that gets destroyed in Back to the Future? Yeah, that sort of thing was not unheard of in the parking lot photo finishing business. In fact, several old timers on Facebook can tell you tales of them backing their cars into photo mats. It's not their fault that things were in the middle of the dang parking lot. Needless to say, many folks out there won't be forgetting photo mats anytime soon, and even though I was not personally alive to see it, I've done my best to capture what it was in every facet. And as an avid film photographer today, I envy the day's film was so widely available it was never more than a parking lot away. I'll see you next time. Address unknown.